Why are you, a total stranger, insisting on staying in our house for such an extended period? My sister-in-law scolded me, her voice filled with anger. After losing my beloved husband, I continued living with my in-laws. Was I not allowed to be there? I never thought you were this kind of woman. Leave as soon as possible. Even my usually kind mother-in-law began to criticize me harshly. If that's how it was, I'd leave on my own. These were the words screamed in my heart, but I suppressed them. I understand, I said, while vowing revenge. My name is Ella, and I am 40 years old. I work as an elementary school teacher. My husband, Arthur, also an elementary school teacher at a different school, was 42 that year. We were married for 12 years. We met at the first elementary school I worked at after graduating from college. Arthur, two years my senior, was a reliable senior colleague who taught me various things about school life. Through work, we were drawn to each other and eventually got married. I love children and became a teacher to spend time with them, but sadly, we didn't have any children. My father-in-law passed away in his 50s before we got married, and Arthur lived with his mother until I joined the family. Thanks to the real estate and other assets inherited from my father-in-law, my mother-in-law was financially secure. However, since the beginning of our marriage, we had decided to pay $2,000 monthly to my in-laws. We had a dream we wanted to realize. Despite needing to save for it, we regularly transferred money to my in-laws for utilities, food, and a small rent out of a sense of duty. We continued to work as teachers, increasingly worried about the growing number of children not attending school. Our dream was to establish a learning center where such children could study comfortably. Arthur's older sister, Harry, who is three years older than him, is married and lives in another state. My sister-in-law has a son, but he left home last spring for studies, so it should be just the two of them now. Although living about an hour's drive away, my sister-in-law visited every weekend, asking my mother-in-law for financial help. My son's tuition is short, can you help a little? My sister-in-law would softly ask. Really, it can't be helped. How much do you need? My mother-in-law would spoil my sister-in-law. For some reason, Arthur couldn't understand why. Frustrated, he finally asked his sister one day, You received a fair amount from Dad's inheritance, right? Why are you always short of money? He asked incredulously. My sister-in-law then retaliated, You don't have any kids, so you wouldn't understand. Raising children is incredibly expensive. You talk about inheritance, but that money can't last forever. However, my sister-in-law's spending was clearly excessive, even in my eyes. Once she asked for money for education, another time for home repairs, and before that for food. Every time, my mother-in-law would give my sister-in-law a considerable amount. I couldn't understand why. That day, we went to our respective schools as usual, an ordinary morning, the usual scenery, until that phone call. I received news that Arthur had collapsed and was rushed to the hospital. Urged to hurry there, I exclaimed in shock, What? My husband collapsed? Confused? But upon reaching the hospital, I found Arthur unconscious, and he had to undergo thorough examinations. I wished it was all a bad dream. But despite aggressive treatment, Arthur passed away that night. Faced with this unexpected event, I didn't even have time to cry, immediately taking leave from work to arrange the funeral. I felt I couldn't mentally survive otherwise. My mother-in-law, likely more heartbroken than me, courteously received the mourners throughout the funeral. It was an opportunity to meet my sister and her family again. My sister, her husband Jack, and their son Mason, who was a college student, helped devotedly. However, my sister-in-law herself didn't seem to grieve over her own brother's death. It almost seemed like she was happy about it. After Jim's funeral, I returned to my mother-in-law's house. My sister-in-law's family said they had other things to do and went home without dropping by. Then, my mother-in-law spoke quietly, Ella, I never thought being bereft of my son would be this lonely. 
Hearing these words, my pent-up sadness burst out, and I broke down crying. If it's okay with you, would you stay in this house forever? I'm lonely living by myself. My mother-in-law spoke kindly to me. Let's support each other from now on, mother. I replied, wiping away my tears. However, more troubles followed. Just as we decided to live together, my mother-in-law suddenly collapsed. It might have been due to the grief of losing her son. She was diagnosed with a stroke. Fortunately, she survived but was left with paralysis in her right side. My mother-in-law, relying on a cane, wished to continue living in her house. There are so many memories in this house. I want to spend my time here, she said with slightly slurred speech, but with determination. I'm fine, so please continue to focus on your work, Ella, my mother-in-law kindly told me. However, I was worried about leaving my half-paralyzed mother-in-law alone at home. We decided to use long-term care insurance for home care with the help of a helper. Even after Arthur passed away, I continued to contribute $2,000 monthly for my mother-in-law. However, my sister-in-law started visiting her mother more frequently. I'm just worried about mom, my sister-in-law said. But could anyone understand this? From past experiences, I felt I shouldn't easily believe my sister-in-law's words. My mother-in-law, having lost her mobility and feeling weak, asked, Ella, Harry wants to live here with us. What do you think? Harry wants to. What about her husband? I asked in surprise. Mason is already in college and not at home. She says it's okay for her to live here alone. Her husband might move here eventually too, my mother-in-law explained. I felt uneasy and asked frankly, if you think it's good, I won't oppose it. But what about me? What are you saying, Ella? You're like a daughter to me. It's totally fine for you to be here, my mother-in-law assured me. However, if my sister-in-law actually moved into the house, I wouldn't be able to stop her like Arthur did. This left me with unresolved anxiety. Amid these concerns, I had to leave the house for a week-long training, leaving my mother-in-law's care to the helper. Mother, I'll be away for a week from tomorrow so please follow the helper's instructions, I said, trying to sound lighthearted to ease my mother-in-law's anxiety. Don't give money to Harry if she comes, and if something seems odd, contact her husband too. I was very worried about the possibility of my sister-in-law visiting the house during my absence. I couldn't concentrate on my training because of this worry. Upon returning home after a week, I was greeted by my sister-in-law. Welcome back. Mom wants to talk to you. My sister-in-law looked at me with a smug smile. I had an ominous feeling entering the living room. My mother-in-law looked at me with a displeased expression. I'm back, I greeted timidly, overwhelmed by the atmosphere. Ella, were you trying to kick me out and put me in a facility? My mother-in-law suddenly accused me with anger. Confused by the situation, my sister-in-law chimed in, Hey. Ella, remember what you said before? You said, I want to put mom in a facility. It's too much to handle her, didn't you? She continued as if I had said such a thing. It's okay since you're a stranger anyway. I'll take care of mom from now on, so you don't need to be here anymore. My sister-in-law said this to me with a deliberately harsh face. My mother-in-law also showed her anger, screaming at me with a fierce look. I can't believe it. You're a nuisance. Just leave quickly. Understood. I will leave. With no strength to argue back, I held back my tears and started packing my belongings, leaving behind the items filled with memories of Arthur. I took only the essentials and left the house. Thank you for everything, I said at the entrance, to which my sister-in-law, who was eager to drive me out, said, You're still here? Leave quickly. A mix of sadness and frustration greatly disturbed my heart. I, being driven out of the house, returned to my parents' home without notice. What happened, Ella? What's with the luggage? My mother couldn't hide her surprise at my sudden return. Sorry for the suddenness, but right now, I don't want to talk about it. I'll go to work from here, so please leave me alone for a while. The room I used to occupy high at my parents' house was now empty. 
I laid down the luggage on the floor and gazed at the ceiling, letting my thoughts wander. What did my sister-in-law plan to do with her own family? My mother-in-law had mentioned that Jack might eventually move in with her, but I never sensed such intentions from my sister-in-law. I wanted to think it was none of my business anymore, but I couldn't stay silent when I thought of my mother-in-law. Then, I remembered something. The day before Arthur collapsed, he tried to tell me something and was about to hand me an envelope, but he was called away by his mother, and I never got to hear about the envelope from him. What could be inside it? Could it be a will? I was worried. Hesitantly, I opened the envelope and checked its contents. It was, seeing what was inside the envelope, I was astonished. The next day, I left for work for my parents' house, reported my training to the principal, returned to my duties, and ended the day as if nothing had happened. Excuse me, I'm leaving now, I said as I prepared to leave, and a colleague said to me, you must be tired from the training. It must have been tough losing your husband. Don't overdo it. However, the reason I was in a hurry to get home wasn't due to fatigue or the sorrow of Arthur's death. I needed to contact Jack and ask about the situation with my sister-in-law. Considering it might turn into a serious conversation, I was hesitant to use my personal phone in a public place where anyone could overhear. On my way home, I sent an email to Jack expressing my desire to talk to him in person. I have something to talk about regarding my wife too, Jack replied immediately. When I got home, I locked myself in my room and called Jack. Jack seemed to have been waiting for my call and responded immediately. Ella, I'm glad. I was just about to contact you. Jack started with a relieved voice. I told him about Harry staying at her mother's house and went on to explain that she was making false claims. I told him that I had been accused of trying to take over the house by sending my mother-in-law to a nursing home based on her lies, and as a result, I was driven out of the house. Really? Where are you now? Jack asked in surprise. I replied that I was at my parents' house, then detailed everything that had happened since the funeral. I'm really sorry about that, he apologized sincerely. No, Jack, you don't need to apologize, I responded. My sister-in-law had a history of leaving home without notice and spending money freely, which seemed to have intensified since her son Mason went to college. Wait, Harry was receiving money from her mother? What happened to that money, he asked. I knew my mother-in-law had been giving my sister-in-law a significant amount of money, but I thought Jack knew about it. I haven't heard anything about that. I've been paying for Mason's tuition, and our family has always been in a tight financial situation, Jack replied, sounding surprised. Actually, I have a request. Could you come to my parents' house next Sunday, I proposed. I felt a bit presumptuous making such a request, but I decided to try it. Their house was about a 30-minute drive from my parents' house and was on the way to my mother-in-law's house. I had planned to meet Jack and then head to my mother-in-law's house together. Understood. I know roughly where it is, so I'll rely on navigation. I'll contact you again when I'm close. Jack agreed to my suggestion and ended the call shortly after. Shortly after, I received a call from my mother-in-law's house. What could it be, just a day after the previous events? With that thought, I answered the phone. Hey you, you used money without permission, didn't you? Give it back immediately, my sister-in-law yelled at me. What do you mean by using money without permission? I asked, confused. I couldn't understand what my sister-in-law was talking about and felt completely misunderstood. When I checked mom's bank account, the balance was too low. What did you use it for? My sister-in-law pressed, but I had certainly not done such a thing. It's true that I forgot to deposit the planned $2,000 due to being preoccupied with my mother-in-law's illness and pain procedures, but I never withdrew money from the savings without permission. Is there some misunderstanding? I firmly replied. My sister-in-law seemed unsatisfied with my answer and raised her voice. Come over on Sunday. Let's clarify this matter. This was convenient for me, so I replied. 
understood. Let's discuss it in front of her, and ended the call. On the planned Sunday, Jack arrived at my parents' house earlier than expected. Oh, you are, my mother said, surprised at Jack's sudden appearance. Yes, he's the husband of my late husband's sister. Mom, you've met him before, haven't you? I explained. My mother couldn't immediately recall who he was but eventually remembered. Oh, uh, yes, I've seen him before. Seeing my mother's realization and joy, I explained, actually, I wanted to consult him about my husband's family matters. After leading Jack to the living room and briefly exchanging greetings, I took out an envelope. I want you to see this. The envelope contained several photos and a report. As I spread the photos and the report in front of Jack, he exclaimed in surprise, What is this? The photo showed my sister-in-law with a young man enjoying herself at a nightclub and heading to a hotel. The report from a detective agency detailed evidence of my sister-in-law's expenses. Arthur entrusted this to me before he passed away, and since he died before we could discuss it, I only recently looked at it. I explained the situation to Jack. Arthur had suspected his sister of reckless spending and had secretly commissioned an investigation. He intended to discuss the results with me, but passed away before he could. Jack trembled with anger at the photos. I thought she was frequently leaving the house. But to think she was doing this, with a sigh full of indignation, Jack said, Ella, can you come with me right now? This situation can't be ignored. I had intended to do so from the start and nodded immediately. Thirty minutes later, we arrived at my mother-in-law's house and rang the doorbell. It's Ella. I've come as promised, I said, and soon heard my sister-in-law's annoyed voice. How long do you plan to make me wait? The sound of unlocking the door came, and the door opened. Come in, my sister-in-law greeted us, but upon seeing Jack, she tried to close the door. Jack quickly grabbed the doorknob. Harry, we need to talk. Can you listen for a moment? He said, holding the door. His voice was calm, but his anger was palpable. My sister-in-law struggled to close the door but couldn't overpower the man's strength and eventually had to leave it open. Fine, what do you want? She said, allowing us to stay at the entrance, seemingly not wanting my mother-in-law to be aware of Jack's unexpected visit. Is that you in these pictures? Who's the man next to you? Jack asked, confronting his wife with the photos. Where did you get these? No way. Harry was shocked upon seeing the photos. Do you remember? Well, who is this? Answer me, Jack, usually mild-mannered, pressed his wife. Just a friend. Can I have yum friends? My sister-in-law retorted. Don't lie. I know everything, Jack yelled at her. Why? Who told you? Realizing my sister-in-law could no longer continue her lies, she looked defeated. Your late brother Arthur was concerned about your spending and had it investigated. Jack calmly revealed the truth. You demanded money from your mother and squandered it all on a nightclub. I'm aware of the entire situation, Jack continued, trying to contain his anger. It's hard enough to pay for Mason's tuition and you exhaust our living expenses and still dare to ask for more money. What a comfortable life, huh? He continued, his voice filled with rage. His anger did not subside. That's enough. I don't care if you leave us. We're getting a divorce, he coldly declared to her. What? My sister-in-law muttered in shock. Didn't you hear me? We're getting a divorce. I'll send the divorce papers later. Fill them out and send them back. Jack stated bluntly. At those words, my sister-in-law collapsed onto a seat. Later, my sister-in-law and Jack proceeded with the divorce through a lawyer and ultimately finalized it. They agreed to consider her spending at the nightclubs as a reason for compensation and to share the payment of Mason's tuition until his university graduation. However, there was a possibility that she might default on the payments so they agreed that a lawyer would collect the payments monthly. After receiving her share of my father-in-law's inheritance, my sister-in-law had squandered it all on her expenses at the nightclub and then set her sights on my mother-in-law's property. 
but she found the bank account balance to be lower than expected, and her plan failed. In fact, it seemed that the money Arthur and I had been giving my mother-in-law was used for living expenses, and given to my sister-in-law as she demanded, leaving almost no. The savings behind my in-law's house belonged to my mother-in-law, and there was probably no more money left to give to my sister-in-law unless the house was sold. I learned from the caregiver that my sister-in-law, realizing her failure, had abandoned my mother-in-law and left. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law continued to live a modest life alone with the help of the caregiver. 